And I want to share with you about someone else we have been holding very much in, in prayer of light, and that is Celeste Ray. I had a lovely visit with Celeste um, last week. And for those of you who are new to St. John's or maybe visiting today, Celeste is a longtime member of our church, and she's been in hospice care for several months now. And she is weaker and um, at many times uncomfortable, and she's uh, ready to go. She verbalizes that very clearly. Um, at the same time, she is still so very Celeste. And uh, depending on when you, when you get there to visit, uh, like last week was just at the right moment, and she was so awake and so alert and so talkative. And so she shared some beautiful memories and some encouraging, inspiring, expansively loving words like only Celeste can do. And then she talked about this place, this church. She talked about St. John's and how much she loves all of you. Matter of fact, she said to tell everyone, she said, hey. <laughs> so that's your message from Celeste. And she talked about the mission and ministry of this place and how grateful she's been to have been a part of it, how um, the word is preached and proclaimed in different ways and also demonstrated. And then suddenly and a little bit seriously, she looked right at me and she said, but why don't we tell people the truth? Why don't we really tell people the truth, the whole truth? about the Bible and about our faith and our understanding of it. Why don't we tell people the truth? Now, I will not um, in any way pretend to share the, the whole of Celeste's theology or understanding of God. Many of you have heard her speak to that, and it's a beautiful thing to hear directly from her. But she said that at least in part because of this. She said it because the way we read Scripture tends to keep God very small. The way we read and understand scripture tends to really put God in a box. And typically, it's a box of our own making and conveniently of a shape that's pleasing to us. I'm, I'm talking about myself here. I think we all have a tendency to do just that. But Celeste God is too big for that box. Celeste's God cannot and will not be put in a box. Her God is too big, too pervasive, too invasive for that. And Celeste's God is everywhere, in everything and in everyone, every person, every animal, every part of creation, all a part of a whole and all containing a part of the divine. But rather than seeing the whole powerful story of it, we tend to read the Bible focused on our favorite passages and with alert attention to discerning what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong, or maybe more often what we're doing right and what other people are doing wrong. Why? Why do we do this? Scripture ought not be used as a weapon against other people or against ourselves. Scripture is the narrative, the story of our faith. And for us, Christians in the Wesleyan tradition, Scripture can be viewed and understood in multiple ways, but always grounded under, in the understanding that it is God's Word, meaning that it is inspired by God. The Methodist Church says the authority of Scripture derives from the movement of God's Spirit in times past and in the reading of it today. The Methodist Church also offers this uh, resource as a challenge for us to approach biblical texts with four questions in mind. So these are the questions. One, what did this passage mean to its original hearers? Two, what part does it play in the Bible's total witness? Three, what does God seem to be saying to my life, my community, my world through this passage? And four, what changes should I consider making as a result of this study? Now, today's gospel text, I think, is a good one to consider using this framework. And I think, um, as I've spent time with this passage, it even suggests that maybe Jesus himself read and understood scripture in a similar way. 
All right, so today's lectionary text is from Luke chapter 7, but we're going to go back a little bit before that in Luke to chapter 4. Following Jesus' temptation and time in the wilderness, he began his ministry, and he began right away to teach in the synagogues. And one of the first texts he unrolled the scroll and read was from Isaiah. These words, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then, just as the people were uh, kind of settling into the awareness that, wait a minute, who, this is Joseph's son? Remember that part? Jesus expounds on the truth by hearkening back once again to the prophets of old, referencing from 1 Kings the story of Elijah and his encounter with a widow and her son who were about to eat the last of their meager rations and prepare to die because of a drought and famine in the land. Their faithfulness in God and God's power allowed them to experience a miracle of abundance and they continued to prepare food with those meager rations and the food never ran out. Just as they were giving God thanks for this miracle, the widow's son grew ill and died. So Elijah prayed to God and again through God's power restored that young man to life. With that background in mind, this is the story Jesus references in Luke 4 when he says, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown, but the truth is this. There were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. Now, Jesus goes on to hearken back to these prophecies of old and the people become angry with him. They become enraged. Some of you may remember this is the story early in Jesus' ministry where they run him out of town and are about to hurl him off of a cliff because he's in the synagogue proclaiming these words. Why? Because Jesus, through the prophets of old, is reminding the people that they are called to care less about their privilege, their pedigree, less about their own status and chosenness and safety, and to care more about their neighbors who had been marginalized and treated unjustly. The poor, the captive, the blind, the oppressed. And then Jesus, informed by the prophets, formed and reformed by the stories of his faith, begins this healing ministry. In the next few chapters in Luke, it's healing after healing. He healed a man with an unclean spirit, healed Simon's mother-in-law of a fever, cured crowds of people with demons and diseases of every type, laying hands on them. He cleansed a leper and a man with a withered hand. He healed greater multitudes of people. He healed a centurion servant. And then we come to our story for today. Jesus raising a widow's son. So as you listen to this passage, remember Jesus' own remembrance of Elijah returning life to a widow's son. And today's text is this. Jesus went down to a, went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on God's people. And this word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. This, all this, all of the above, is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
The prophetic stories of Isaiah and Elijah informed Jesus' life and ministries. All of those stories and the stories of Jesus informed the disciples' lives and ministries. The prophets and Jesus and the disciples all inform our lives and ministries if we let them. Jesus brings life from death. He sees the plight of the widow, recognizes how vulnerable she is, and has compassion on her. In the midst of her grief and hopelessness, in the midst of death and despair, Jesus reaches in, touches her son, and offers an elevating word. Rise. Rise. Now, I think we all come here today with our own need for an elevating word, a word to lift us up and move us forward, a word to help us receive healing, and a word to help us offer healing to a hurting world. I know I'm always waiting for that kind of word. So this is it, a word from Jesus himself, a word I'm preaching to myself and sharing with you, and that word is rise. Wherever you find yourself today, you may be hurt, betrayed, weary. You may be grieving a loss or reeling from a broken relationship. You may be tired of trying, depressed, and anxious. You may be regretful of the past or fearful about the future. Whatever it is, whatever is holding you, depleting your spirit, limiting your full embrace of life, listen and respond to the good word. Rise. Rise and receive your healing. Rise and be renewed. Rise and be alert. Watch for opportunities then to bring a healing word to someone who needs it most. You don't have to save the whole world, but you can offer healing to someone. And like Isaiah and Elijah and Jesus, you can offer a healing word to someone others have forgotten, someone on the margins of life. So be a voice for justice, be an instrument of peace. Rise and receive your healing. Rise and bring healing to a hurting world. And let's all take that challenge to tell the truth, the full truth about scripture, the truth about how very big God is. And that we are all living in the power and the mystery of God's time. Kairos time. The more we immerse ourselves in the story and allow our spirits to dwell in God's spirit, the more ready we are to rise when we need it the most. Rise and receive your healing. Rise and bring healing to a hurting world. And do so in the name and power of our expansively loving and merciful God. Amen.